Hey there, welcome to day 15. And this one, we're going to be processing video, audio, and images using Python in a package called MoviePy. Now, we're going to start off by creating thumbnails from any given image, which is actually really useful because you can automate the process of creating thumbnails for all of your videos, which is also really awesome if you work on, let's say, for instance, YouTube and you want to, you know, use one of the screenshots from a video and you don't want to have to scrub through the, the video itself and do a screenshot. That's one of many examples of why you'd want to use MoviePy. So before we actually get started, what we're going to do is we have to set up our system a little bit more. And the reason for that is because MoviePy is really supercharged with two other packages. One is called Image Magic and the other one is called FFmpeg. So to actually follow along with our guide on getting this going, you can go to our GitHub, which of course is github.com slash coding for entrepreneurs, go to the 30 days of Python repo and into day 15 and setup.md. This will show you some of the things that we're doing and then the installation requirements, FFmpeg and image magic. Now, if you're on Windows, you can go to this timestamp right here. That's going to actually show you how to do all of it. Install FFmpeg and Image Magic, and then we'll actually all come back and work together. If you're on Linux, well, you know that Linux has a lot of different distributions, so we can't cover installing on every Linux distribution. So just check out the links that we have there. Really, it's just ffmpeg.org or imagemagic.org. You can go to both of those places and just download the process that you need. Okay, so for us Mac users, we're gonna be using Homebrew. Now, if you don't have Homebrew installed, go to brew.sh and then copy and paste this command into your terminal so that you can do something like this, brew. Now, if you see this, that's a good sign. And what you're just gonna to wanna to do is upgrade brew. So just go ahead and do brew update and maybe even brew upgrade. So after that, we're just gonna run brew install ffmpeg and image magic with a k at the end we hit enter and of course this installation process might take a while depending on your system but after you do it we can just type out ffmpeg and now your entire system can use ffmpeg we're going to talk about this more in just a moment uh, but now that we have that, that it's really simple our movie pie is now ready to actually use it because if once it's on your system movie pie can actually run with it and now we can finish the rest of the setup process. So if you're skipping the Windows part, which you probably are if you're on Mac, go ahead and jump to this timestamp. To get the most out of MoviePy on Windows or really any system, we're gonna to wanna to use FFmpeg and Image Magic. Now in this one, I'm gonna show you how to install FFmpeg directly from that or you can use Image Magic. Just go ahead and download its installation and make sure FFmpeg is checked. I'll show you how to do both things, but I wanna start with ffmpeg.org and then going into download, clicking on the Windows icon and Windows Builds. Notice this is provided by another service, but it is a reliable one as ffmpeg.org references it. So we're gonna go ahead and download this zip file. Once it downloads, you'll see something like this in your downloads folder. I'm gonna go ahead and actually rename this to just FFmpeg. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring this over into my C drive. So into my C drive and I'll go ahead and hit continue. Now that it's in my C drive, I'm gonna go ahead and extract it here. So with 7-zip, I'm gonna hit extract here. And the reason for this is this is now where my location for FFmpeg will be. Uh, as you see that this directory has now been created. And so I can actually reference this in my environment variables. So all I need to do is add this to my systems path for the bin so I can actually call the application of FFmpeg. I could certainly move that binary right there anywhere I want to on my system and be able to run it, but it's probably best to just leave it inside of this FFmpeg folder. Um, so I'm actually going to delete this other one that I have in here. If yours was renamed this way, like if you still have this naming convention altogether, just rename it to FFmpeg. It's going to save us some time in just a moment. So now what I'm going to do is add this to my path. I'll hit the start menu and type out environment 
variables and you're going to want to edit the system environment variables. And then we're going to go ahead and click on environment variables. This should pop up right here. Click on that link. And then with that, we will see this window icon and we're just going to want to edit our system environment variables for path right there and then click on edit. Okay, so in here, you just wanna make sure that you add this right here. So C FFmpeg slash Ben. And with that, you will be able to actually use FFmpeg in command prompt and PowerShell. Uh, so let's go ahead and verify that by just opening up PowerShell and FFmpeg. I should get something like this. Now the reason, of course, I renamed it was so that my environment variables was really easy to work with, right? If I didn't rename it, then I would have to have a longer item here for the path once I added it in to those environment variables. Now that's the manual way of adding FFmpeg. A automated way is using ImageMagick. And of course we want ImageMagick anyway, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to imagemagick.org, click on download, and then I'm gonna scroll down to the Windows binary release. And I want to grab the first one that it has here with the DLL.exe. You can try some of the other ones, but this one I've found is the easiest one to work with. So I hit download on the HTTP. And of course, in my case, I actually already downloaded it. Uh, it's right here. So I'll go ahead and double click and open that. And we're going to run this. So uh, naturally, we're going to accept to the agreement. Hit next. We can install it in the default location, that's fine. You can leave it as the default name or you can change it, it's up to you. Notice that in here, this is the option to install FFmpeg. So we could have saved like two minutes or three um, installing FFmpeg by just using Image Magic, but I wanted to show you that there is the manual way of doing it and that is a valid way. So as that's installing, I'm actually gonna open up my program files. So back into my C drive into program files and I'm gonna look for image magic. I'm assuming it's already done. It looks like it is. And I'm not gonna view the index.html. So going into image magic here, if I scroll down a little bit, I will see that binary of FFmpeg. I believe it's the same size as the one we just downloaded. So let's go ahead and just check that out by opening up a file explorer, going into there, into our bin. And we've got FFmpeg right here. So there, the one that we downloaded directly from FFmpeg is just a little bit smaller than the one that's inside of ImageMagick. Perhaps they add some additional things to it. Uh, but now we have FFmpeg installed two times. So we can definitely use FFmpeg on our command line, which also means that MoviePie will be able to use it as well. Now that we have FFmpeg installed, we can open up Terminal or PowerShell and actually type out the command and see all of these different options. Now, FFmpeg is powerful in of itself. You don't actually need a whole lot of things beyond it, but customizing it and actually using it, I would argue is not that friendly for a new developer, let alone a Python developer. So we use MoviePie to do all sorts of things that FFmpeg can do out of the box. One of those things being like changing from an AVI file to an MP4 file. So video format changing. That's not that big of a deal with it, just FFmpeg. Or extracting audio from a video, also not that big of a deal. But we're not gonna actually spend a whole lot of time on this. I just wanna mention it because it is a really cool program and if you wanna learn more about it, I recommend that you do. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start our project. I'm gonna create a directory called day 15. Now in my case, I actually have already created this because there's a number of things I wanted to do prior to actually getting here. So I made a folder called day 15 and I made a pip EMV, which we'll do in just a moment as well. But I also downloaded a couple files here. I downloaded an audio sample as well as sample.mp4. So if you wanna actually do exactly what I did, you're gonna go back into that repo and you can scroll towards the bottom and look at the base project start. Right, so we're gonna make these directories here. These are where we're gonna store some of those files. And then we're gonna create conf.py, which I'll do in a moment. And then you can download these audio and video samples. These are things that you can use if you want. They're not that big of a deal. It's just more of, um, we need an MP3 file and an MP4 file. So a video file and an audio file that we can actually work with. 
In my case, my video file also has audio, so we will be doing that as well. So now let's go ahead and actually create our project. So again, I already have day 15 as a folder created, so I'll CD into day 15, and then I'll go ahead and do pip env install, and we'll do Python 3.8 and MoviePy. We'll hit enter. And of course, mine's already installed. I already have all of that thing, all those things set up, uh, but yours might not. Next, what we wanna do is actually make all of these directories here, right? So inside of this project that I'm working on, I want these directories so I have somewhere to store my outputs. That's the main thing, but then also a uniform way of where our inputs are coming from. So if you're following along with me, I recommend that you do it in this way. That way you won't have any issues with the code as it relates to where things are stored. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into pipmv shell. And the first thing I need to do is make dir data. I already have it. Next one is make dir samples. Again, I already have it. And then inputs and outputs. Okay. Next, what I want to do is actually make a file called conf.py. Now, all of my other actual modules will be importing and using at least the sample inputs and the sample outputs. Uh, so we want to just go ahead and grab that and make sure that we have it in our project as well. So on day 15, I'm of course now in VS Code, I'm going to go ahead and do conf.py and just paste these things in there. Now, if you're confused at all on how these are working, uh, just a quick recap. First of all, this gives us the path directly to where conf.py is. Baster gives us the directory that it lives in, right? In my case, it's day 15. And then we have paths to the directories we just created, the data one, the samples one, and all that. Then, of course, the audio and sample, you want to put that into the inputs directory itself so that you have your video and audio actually there and ready to go. Now let's actually get to some of the more interesting parts and that's actually coding it. So in day 15, I'm gonna make a new file here and I'm just gonna call this one and thumbs.py as in one thumbnails. And let's make sure that this is inside of day 15. And I'm gonna go ahead and do from conf import. Well, the things that I wanna import are sample inputs and sample outputs. So sample inputs and sample outputs outputs. Now, of course, I want these things installed so that I have something to work from, right? So I want to actually grab my source file, or in my case, I'll call it source path. And I'll do ospath.join, and there's going to be sample inputs, and then sample.mp4. Now, in my case, that is how I named the video file. So of course, that is how I need to reference it, right? Okay, cool. So that should give me the video file. The next thing I need to do is actually import from MoviePy. I'm gonna go ahead and do from MoviePy.editor import all. So this will import everything. Uh, this isn't always standard practice, but I'm actually going off of what they have in their documentation to make this easy for us. Now, if you want to be more explicit, you could say video file clip. This is actually the class that we'll end up using. But again, I'm gonna go ahead and use all. Now what I'm gonna do is initialize a clip. So the clip instance or this object that I'm creating will come from a video file. Um, so uh, as far as I know, MoviePie doesn't work well with webcam. So you can't actually do what I'm about to do from webcam footage. It has to be a stored and saved file. Although I think there's a lot of different file types that are that are actually supported. So an MP4 is not just the only one. So we'll go ahead and say video file clip, and then we're gonna reference the source that we had, which of course is our source path. So I can do some cool stuff with this and I can actually print out the clip.reader.fps. FPS means frames per second. So what this will give me is the amount of frames that are shown every single second. And I can also print out clip.reader.number of frames, so in frames, and that will actually give me the number of frames that this entire clip has. 
And of course, if you divided these numbers together, you would actually get what that clip's duration is. But you can also do clip dot duration, and that should actually give us the file duration of how long that is anyway. So let's go ahead and open up the terminal inside of our project here inside of VS Code. I'm going to close down the Explorer for a moment and let's list things out. Let's go ahead and change into day 15 and pip v shell. Okay, and then python dash i one thumbs dot pi. Okay, so what we should see is three print statements. The first one is the frames per second. The second one is the actual number of frames. And then finally, the duration of the clip. And that's in seconds, right? So this is seconds. So what we want to do is actually turn each frame into its own image, right? And there's several different ways on how we could go about doing this. One way is to take what the duration of the clip is and go every second. Like, let's actually do that. So I'll go ahead and say, duration equals to clip dot duration. Another way to call this is also clip dot reader dot duration. And we can say for I in range, well, we would do zero and then duration plus one. Now that's to include that last second. And what I is, is this is gonna be the frame at I seconds. So whatever frame that is at i seconds, you would actually be able to see that. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure that that's string substitution is correct there. So what I can do is I can say frame equals to clip dot get frame, and then the seconds being whatever i is. Now, if you remember back to when I did the print statement of the duration, you actually need to use an integer value. So this is 30.17 seconds. So you actually need to use a 30 seconds or 10 seconds, nine seconds, and so on for this get frame call. So I'm just gonna call int of i. And with this, I can actually save this somewhere. But before I do that, I'm just gonna go ahead and print out this frame so we can talk about it. So I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of the, the interactive shell and I'll run that again. Uh, and, and it's giving me a float cannot be interpreted as an integer. So this is my range here. So let's actually turn my range and I'll go ahead and say max duration. Because of course, ranges or this call right here has to be a number. And going back, 30.17 is not a number, but rather a float. So we'll just do int of duration plus one. So max duration is gonna be whatever that is. Okay, so um, let's actually try it again without integer of i. So we'll see if that still gives me an integer or not. And actually it should. It should actually give me an integer because of what I just did with max duration because range will loop through each iteration. It will be iteration one or actually iteration zero, one, two, and so on. Um, so let's go ahead and run that again. So we see something very strange. We see the frame at a certain number of seconds, right? So that's that print statement. Uh, but then we see all of these numbers here. And what this is, is actually what's called a NumPy array. And this is actually giving us the color values for each individual pixel. And as you know, an image can have thousands of pixels. So it's actually giving us all of that data. Now, this is not necessarily that useful yet because you may or may not know machine learning or computer vision. But if you understand or study any of those things, they actually learn from the pixel value of any given image, right? So this is actually really cool because we can see sort of the underlying basis for what will be much more advanced usage of grabbing images. So in other words, if you were using machine learning, you could run what's called inference right here on this NumPy array, which is sweet. Uh, but what we can also do is use a package called pillow to actually turn each frame into its own image. So what I need to do is actually install one more thing. So let's go ahead and close out of that interactive shell and I'll do pip env install pillow. This is the Python image library. What pillow allows me to do really easily is to take a 
NumPy array and turn it into an actual image. In other words, take all of these values that are in this big array, like think of it as thousands of numbers, and turn that into an actual image in a very easy way and something you'll see a lot once you get into computer vision if you ever do. So we're gonna do from pill import image, the actual image class. And this we are gonna go ahead and say new img equals to image dot from array. Okay, so from array, we're gonna pass in that frame there. So each frame is a numpy array, useful for inference or to create new images. So we can just do new image, new img dot save, and then some sort of output path, right? So uh, we did create a directory called sample outputs. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another one and I'm gonna call this the thumbnail dir, and we'll say ospath.join. It's gonna be the sample outputs and thumbnails. And then we'll do os.make dirs and this thumbnail dir exist. Um, okay, equals to true. Okay, so now I have a directory as to where I can store these things. So all I need to do is say new img file path equals to ospath.join, that new directory that we just created, and then some sort of file name. In my case, I'm gonna keep it as the name of the number of seconds it is. So in other words, the actual iteration that it is. So F and then I. So I need to turn it into a string of .jpg and then we will save it to this path in just a moment. Now, the reason I recommend that you do this as well has to do with sorting later when we wanna actually reuse these images in the future to actually sort them and turn them into a logical video in the correct order, uh, which we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So let's go ahead and save this. And this time I'm not gonna print out the frame itself. When you print it out, usually print statements actually take up some, some memory and some bandwidth, so it actually slows things down quite a bit. So with that running, I'll go ahead and run python one underscore thumbs dot pi, no interactive shell this time, and I'll just go ahead and run it. It's gonna do every single frame at those individual seconds. Uh, perhaps I wanna actually do frame at those seconds and then also print out the file path as well. So I'll just go ahead and add that in there saved at that file path. So that's gonna be our new print statement, uh, which we could run it again if we wanted to actually see what that's gonna be. Of course, in my case, that's, that's not a big surprise as to where it is. But if I look at my outputs, I can see each image that's actually coming through. All right, so I've now actually created every thumbnail per second. All right, so every second I can actually create a new thumbnail. And now that's cool. So we can do it based off of the duration, but what if I wanted to do it, let's say for instance, based off of the actual number of frames or the frames themselves, not this range here. So what I can do is, let's just copy this exactly. And I'm gonna paste right underneath it. I can actually iterate through all of the frames. So let's change the variable inside of the iterable to frame. And then this time I'm just gonna say clip dot enter frames. What this allows me to do is actually circumvent using the get frame here. And this will actually create for every single frame. Now remember, when we actually printed out the number of frames, I got something like 900. But what I want is, well, do I actually want 900 of these frames? Potentially. And I also wanna actually make sure that I know what frame number I'm on, right? The iteration of this frame. Now, of course, I could say something like i equals to zero, and then at the end of this, doing i plus equals to zero or one, right? So that actually counts each time I'm looping through this. Or what I could do is something even easier called enumerate. So if I wrap this in enumerate, a built-in Python function that actually turns it into enumerated like iterations, right? So now i is that actual same number of iteration, much like we did with this range here where it's a number. This time it's a number and then whatever the iterable item is. In this case, it's a frame. So, so this is doing it now every single frame. It's gonna actually create 
a brand new image for me. So it's no longer based off of se uh, sections or seconds, but rather the actual number of frames themselves. So I'm gonna make another directory. This time I'm not gonna call it thumbnails dir. I'm just gonna call it thumbnails dash frame or per frame. So thumbnail per frame dir and just leave it in as that. So I'm going to I'm going to get rid of my print statements here uh, just so I can make it run just a little bit faster and I'll run that once again. And now if we look inside of that directory, uh, I might actually need to create the directory. I think I skipped that part of make dirs and yes, I did. So let's close this out. Let's make that directory as well. Let's run it again. And now I should get both of those directories, it might take a moment to actually run through of it. And especially depending on how long your clip is, uh, it might take even longer. So this will do every single frame, right? And I get iter, oops, I did inter frames. It should be iter frames. Well, a little mistake there, like iterate the frames, right? Iterate iter frames. Okay, um, so again, this is gonna go through every single frame. Now, if I actually wanted this based off of seconds and frames per second, let's think about this for a moment. So if I grabbed the number of frames and the number of frames per second, I can say FPS equals to clip.reader.fps, and then the number of frames, so in frames equals to that same thing up here. Now I can actually say seconds equals to the number of frames divided by frames per second. And I might want to times it by 1.0 to make sure that it's not rounding on me. Python 3 doesn't actually do that very often, but in case you need to, just make sure you just run something like that. Therefore, you don't have any rounding errors. Um, so what I get here is the number of seconds inside of this clip. Of course, this is the mathematical way to find it, even though you can grab it directly from the clip. So if I actually wanted to do this iter frames thing for those seconds, I need to think about, well, what iteration do I actually want to run this? Well, it's on every second. So if I want to run it every second, I need to do it based off of some value of frames per second, right? So if it's 10 frames per second, I need to save a new image every single 10 frames. So to think of this, I can actually go off of the current iteration, which is actually like, this is gonna be, you could call it in or in frame or frame index, right? There's all sorts of things you can think of that as. I'm gonna leave it in as I. So what I is gonna say is this is frame zero, this is frame one, this is frame two and so on. So for me to know that it's one of those seconds, it's actually a very similar formula of this up here. I would say that if I divided by frames per second um, basically has a leftover, a remainder equals to zero, that means that it's divisible by frames per second. And that means that we could make the argument or the case that it's actually a second. Because again, frames per second will count the number of frames that it happens every second. So another way to actually write this, of course, is using modulo. So if I said I modulo FPS equals equals to zero, then I can actually run this call. And this would actually happen at the current time. So I could say current seconds now is equal to the I divided by FPS. So this will give me whatever those current seconds are. And if I wanna actually change it into milliseconds, which might be a good idea, we just times this by a thousand. So this is now gonna be in here as current seconds. And again, it's gonna be current milliseconds or current MS. Okay, so this gives me a much different look at this. Instead of having, you know, 900 frames or however many frames, this is actually gonna do it on the n number of frames that I want, right? Which is pretty cool. So that also means that 
If I wanted to change this to, let's say for instance, every half second, then this call here is just gonna be slightly different. So let's go ahead and grab this and paste underneath here. And up here, I'm gonna go ahead and make one more thing, one more directory frames per half second, per half second dir. And let's go ahead and make sure we're making that one. So OS make durs and exist okay equals to true. I'm gonna close this down. Okay, so going back down to the very bottom one, this is gonna be every half second, right? So this, this part is gonna be a little bit different. Um, I can still enumerate through the actual number of frames, right? So either way, I want to enumerate through the number of frames. And I can say frames per, I'll call it frames per half second or FPHS. Pretty sure that's not an actual acronym anyone uses, but this is just gonna be the integer of frames per second divided by 2.0, right? So we wanna round it up to the nearest integer. So this means then if I change that to FPS, this should actually give me the every frames per second or every half frame per second. So if it's 30 frames per second, this is gonna be every 15 frames, I will be divisible by 15 with zero remainder, which again was what that's saying. This can still take the current time, right? So I divided by FPS is still giving us whatever that current time is, because again, it's iterating through all of them. But this time now, it's actually every half second. So that's giving me now every half second of when this is gonna happen. So we can run this. And again, the reason that it's every half second is we take frames per second and we divide it by two. That means the seconds have been cut in half and we now have 15 frames per half second, or if, you know, if it's 30 frames per second, then it's 15 per frames per half second. And then we can actually run that iteration here. Now you could do that every fourth or, or you could do it every other frame. I mean, there's a lot of different ways on how you could go about doing this, but the idea is that now we have a little bit better understanding, hopefully a little bit better understanding of how to do the math on all of these different things which I don't think is that complicated to do. So one of the things that I actually ran into just now is I have one of my directories with all of the items. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to delete the entire outputs directory, okay? And what, one other thing I noticed really quickly was my current milliseconds turns into being um, a float number. So I just wanna turn it into an integer by using .int so that the file name doesn't have any other periods other than the .jpg there. And that will, that will solve that problem for me there. And I also wanna do that up here as well. Okay. So when we actually delete directories, this make dirs will make the parent directory as well, right? So it doesn't just make the directory at the end of it, but all of them. So I'll go ahead and run this again and we look in our outputs, we get all of our thumbnails. Um, you know, it, it's gonna take a moment for all of them to finish. Uh, but once they do, we now will have all of the thumbnails or various ways on how to create thumbnails from this these videos. Um, and of course this works for any video. Now, uh, the speed as to which it's gonna actually create the thumbnails all depends on a number of factors. One and the main one is how big your machine is how much memory is being used, how big the video is. Like those numbers obviously are gonna make a big difference in, in actually creating any given thumbnail. So the next thing is um, the least efficient method that I've done was this one right here, where it's getting the frame each time. It's actually much better to just iterate through the frames. This will be a lot more effective, uh, but that's a little bit more complicated than just saying, oh, through some duration, obviously it's gonna iterate through each second because the duration itself is in seconds. Um, so that makes the, that whole process a lot easier. But iterate frames or iter frames will absolutely be more efficient and thus much faster um, getting all of our data. But now if we see in our thumbnails per half second, um, we've got zero, 500, 1000. Again, if it's in milliseconds, that gives me these half seconds. So 500 milliseconds is half of a second. 
and that's the reason I actually made it into milliseconds is to make sure that we're not putting 0 0.5 point JPEG, but rather 500 milliseconds. And the reason I did it in per frame as well is just to kind of get in the habit of like, yeah, I want to make sure that this is done in milliseconds. This is a, a very much or it's a much more robust way to actually grab what any given timestamp is because it's a really simple calculation to then grab what the actual seconds are. Just knock three zeros off of it and you get the number of seconds that are in there or the number of half seconds. Um, cool. So that's actually creating thumbnails. Um, now, of course, this is just one piece of the very many things that MoviePie can do for us, um, but this is a very practical one. Um, so hopefully this part makes a lot of sense for you, but stay with us because we're going to do a lot more with MoviePie. Now we're going to go ahead and create a video from a folder of images. And in that last one, I created the Python module one underscore thumbs. I'm actually going to change it to being the number one instead of O N E. This just gives me a little bit better order of how my files are gonna come out, that's it. So inside of day 15, of course, I'm gonna go ahead and make a new file in here and we're gonna call this two and this is dir to vid, as in directory to video or folder to video. So back in one thumbs, I'm gonna go ahead and just copy the first eight lines into here. Now the reason I have these first eight lines, well, First of all, I probably don't need that source path anymore, but I do want these different directories. And the reason for that is because I'm probably gonna make a video off of each one, or at least have the option to do that in the future. So let's go ahead and just grab a path or set a path for our output video. And this is gonna be sample outputs, just like we did here. And then this one is gonna just be the thumbs.mp4. Okay. So the nice thing about MoviePie is it will actually infer a lot of things from the extension that you use, as in the codecs necessary to actually make that. Um, we're not going to worry about that too much. So just like what we saw before, we had the image, or rather the video file clip. We can also do another one called image sequence clip. So I'm going to go ahead and say clip equals to image sequence clip. And this is also imported from the MoviePie editor. So if you, in the last one, didn't use the all import, you would want to make sure you import that. And this is now a directory or file paths of the images that we want. All right. So if I actually put in this thumbnail dir, it might work, but I actually want to make sure that this thumbnail directory actually has the files I need. So I'll go ahead and just say this dir equals to whatever that thumbnail directory is. But really, uh, we're going to go ahead and say os path dot list dir, as in list directory. So all of the items in there are there. So I'm going to go ahead and say the file paths equals to well, we're gonna do an iteration here. I'll just go ahead and first off say path for path in this dir. Uh, but what that actually is gonna give me is not a path, but rather a file name. But I just wanted to put that just to make sure that I can add this if statement, if path that ends with JPEG. I just wanna make sure that all of my JPEG images are coming through here. Because in the case of this thumbnail directory, there might be other files in there. And of course, I want to ignore what those other files are. And this is actually not a path. This is a file name. So I'm going to just change it to F name as in file name like that. So these are actually file names. Now to turn it into a path, we would just do OS path dot join that original thumbnail dir. So thumbnail dir. And that file name. Now this is an inline iteration. Another way to write this, I will just show you, is file paths equals to this for fname in this dir. Then we'll say if fname dot ends with JPEG. Then we'll go ahead and say path equals to os path dot join thumbnail dir fname. And then file paths 
dot append path. Uh, that is the exact same thing, but this one is just all in one line. Cool. I'm going to leave that commented out. That is a little bit of a review, but hopefully it makes sense. But now that we've got these file paths, I can go ahead and grab this clip just like that. And I can run something called clip dot write video file. Okay. So image sequence clip, no surprise here. It actually is a sequence of images and we're just bringing them all together. And then we're going to write this file. But I also need to declare the frames per second here. So in this case, I'm going to do four frames per second. Because again, I'm using only a handful of images. So if I want this to be a little bit longer, I'll have the images last a little bit longer. So each image as a frame will last a little bit longer. Um, so that turns it into a frames per second of being four. And then the writing to the file will be our output video. Okay. So now that in our project, I'll go ahead and run Python two underscore dir to vid dot pi and hit enter. And I'm getting, we don't have list dir. Oops, that should not be OS path, but rather OS dot list dir. There we go. And we run it again. And this time it does a little bit more processing and now it's actually showing us the movie pie thing. And if we look at our outputs, we should see a video here. And if I reveal it in the finder window or the file explorer, depending on where you are, uh, you should actually see it, it kind of running in a way that, that I expected. Okay. So um, that is using every second. Right, and, and it's every second as a frames per second. So if I wanted to change it to where it was literally every second, I would just change frames per second to being one. And what this would do is actually turn this into a 30 second video. It doesn't actually have all of the frames, but it is the same duration of a video as the original one. So it, it, it's really, uh, it's gonna be a lot more choppy than the original one. So that's kind of cool. But we actually have a problem with how this is. And that's our file paths. So I'm not gonna actually write this clip just yet. I'll go ahead and print out the file paths themselves. And I will also run the interactive shell here with dash I, hit enter. I'm gonna close this down a little bit, open this up. And what I see is some sort of strange ordering going on here, right? The very first item is 8.jpg. The next one is 9. And actually, on, upon further inspection, you might see some issues with the video itself, like the ordering of the video, like this is out of order, uh, which you could verify by actually looking at the video. Um, so yeah, this is nice. This is super convenient of a method to actually be able to just, you know, get a list of file paths and then output them to a video. Uh, so that's definitely the easy way. But this is incorrect. This is not actually how we want to go about doing this. So I'll leave this method in here in case you want to create a video from these file paths in this way. Uh, but what I want to do is actually take a little bit of a harder step, and that is actually better understanding how to go through an entire directory using a method called walk. Um, so the first thing I want to do is create a dictionary, and I'm going to call this dictionary directory, as in the directory itself. So directory and it's equal to an empty dictionary and then we're going to do for root ders in files in os or rather not files in files but rather files in os.walk and then the directory that i want to go through in this case i'm going to do thumbnails per frame okay so this will actually walk through that directory every file that's in there including child files. So if you have other directories in there, it's going to definitely go through all of those. So to get the file path, we need to actually go through each file. It's really simple. We just do for the, I'll say underscore file in files. The reason I'm using underscore file or well, let's just use F name in files. The file path is OS path join and there's going to be root and F name. Okay, so this will give us the file path that I'm looking for for every single file. We could print all that out to see exactly what it is that I mean by that. 
Um, but what I wanna do is actually grab and create key value pairs for every single file. So that means that I'm gonna go ahead and come in here and say try key equals to the float of name dot replace. And it's going to replace dot JPEG because I know it's a JPEG image with an empty string. And then it's gonna try and grab from the F name. It's gonna try and look for a float item in there. Otherwise, it'll run an error. Like if there isn't an actual float in there, it will run an exception. And that in that case, we'll just say key equals to none. And then we'll do if key is not equal to none, then I'll go into my dictionary value that I set up here for the key. And we'll set that equal to the file path or the actual value that we're gonna be using. So this now gives me a directory full of key value pairs that are coming from the name of the file itself. So the name of the file will have a number or um, a, you know, a big number, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna turn that into a float and then that's gonna be my new key value pair for this di uh, directory, this directory dictionary that is, okay? Um, so now that I've got that, what I can do is I can say 4K in sorted directory.keys and then I can actually print out what K is. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this. I'm gonna open up the terminal here. Let's clear out what we've got. So I'll exit out of this and run the interactive shell again. And what I see is all of these numbers, right? So I've got 0, 0, 0.0 and so on, all the way down to 3000. So they're actually in order. And that's actually why I did this, is to, to add the name of the file to the directory and turn it into the file path. Now you actually don't have to convert it into a float. That's not 100% necessary. You could just remove the file extension and use that as the key and then sort it as well. So this will also sort ABC or, or like character values as well if, if you need to. Uh, but with this, what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna grab whatever the file path is at this key value pair and say new paths equals to this empty like list here. And so I'll go ahead and grab the directory at whatever that key value is. And then that's gonna be my new file path. So I'll say file path equals to that. So new paths.append file path. And I don't need to print out that print statement anymore. And I can scroll back up to my clip or that original clip and actually output this based off of my new paths now. Okay, so that's another image sequence clip. It's now in a different order. Uh, so if I exit this out, uh, I'm still doing frames per second. Let's just change that to, I don't know, 10. It's gonna be a much shorter video. Um, so this should now be in an order that makes sense based off of how I named those files. Uh, and then let's go ahead and open up the finder for this one. And this looks a lot closer to the order that I actually had in that video. It should be actually pretty accurate to that order. Uh, but there's actually one more thing that I can do is I can actually turn each individual file path into a frame itself. So I wanna use something called image clip, not just image sequence clip, but image clip. Uh, it's another class that's imported by the editor by default. So now what I can do is say, after I have these new paths, I can say my clips equals to just an empty list here. And now I can say for path in the list of these new paths, which it is a list, but I'm gonna change that in just a moment. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and say clip, or rather frame equals to image clip, of that path. And let's go ahead and just print out what that frame is and what it looks like. So we'll exit out of here and run that again. And we're getting an object here. It's an image clip object. Uh, if you printed out the dir, so doing the dir gives you all of the methods available on there. 
Uh, subclip is one of them that's really useful for images, which we'll cover in a little while. Uh, but what we want to find is the .img. So we actually want to append my clips .append frame.img. And after we do that, we will then make our image sequence clip. Actually, let's make sure we keep this in as a backup or for reference, that is. We'll put my clips in here now and our frames per second, I'll just do 22. We'll exit out of here and then we'll run that again. And of course, if you wanted to actually see what the frame.img looked like, I'm going to guess that you might have some intuition as to what that will look like. And if you didn't, that's okay, but it's a, it's a NumPy array, just like what we talked about before. So uh, that's actually how you would get the NumPy array from a specific image itself. So if you wanted to open up any given image and turn it into a NumPy array, that's a one way to do it with actual MoviePy. Uh, but now that we've done this, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at my new outputted clip. And this one's going to go really fast because it's only it's 22 frames per second and there's not that many frames. Um, so that's the, the more challenging way to do it. Um, now, of course, you could use your new paths of this order and just stop here, just like reorder them in some sort of way. Um, there are more advanced methods of reordering this stuff. So like based off of the date and time that is created and and stuff like that, those things I'm just not going to get into here. But the purpose of this was to see that there's multiple ways to take a directory and turn it into a video. So now that we understand how to go from video to images and images back to video, now let's go ahead and take a look at how to turn a video into a subclip and then a GIF. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new file in our project here and we'll call this three create gif.py. And we're gonna do a lot of the same imports we did already. We might not need pill, but I'll leave it in there just in case. And I'm also gonna do another import that we'll come up with in a moment, which is from moviepy.video.fx.all import crop. Now the actual location of this might change, but the idea is that we wanna crop our video clip at some point as well. And I wanna go back to the first one to grab the source video itself. So coming back into three. Okay, so we've got our source file here. And as you remember, just creating a clip is as simple as doing clip equals to video file clip and the path that we have it. In our case, it's the source path. And it's really simple. We can set our frames per second and I'll just set the frames per second to the exact clips frames per second. So clip.reader.fps. And then we can get a subclip of this. Now a subclip is just a portion of the clip. Now I would check the MoviePy docs if you want more details on this. But the general idea is that I can say clip equals to clip.subclip and then the time that I want. So if I wanted between you know 10 and 20 seconds, so this is a 10 second long clip, you would just write that. But yes, there are more advanced options for this. Now, when you actually call subclip, it returns back another clip. So I'm just gonna call this subclip. And then that itself is a video file clip itself from the original one. And so I can just call subclip.write gif, and then we wanna actually have a output path. So let's go ahead and copy our source path and call this output path one, and I'll call this sample.gif, sample1.gif, and we'll put this in our sample outputs. And we might as well actually make a gif dir. So I'll say gif dir equals to ospath.join sample outputs and gif and os.make dirs gif dir and exist. Okay. Okay, so now I'll actually put it into my gifs directory. Let's call it gifs instead of just gif. 
Okay, so my first output is like this. Now, notice I only took a small clip of it. I didn't actually change the size of it. So I will change the size of it to speed up the time it takes to actually make this GIF. So we can say subclip equals to, and this is gonna now be subclip.resize, and it's gonna take a dynamic width, so we'll just say width equals to 320. So this will automatically resize it without breaking the scale of the actual clip itself, which we'll see in just a moment. And you could designate something like height equals to 320 as well, um, which we'll also take a look at as in, in just a second. But the idea here is whenever you run a method like this or like this, it actually returns back the original instance. So running subclip like this will actually allow me to resize it. But if you forget and you run something like this and you're wondering, hey, why isn't it being resized? Well, that's because you need the result from this. So by setting subclip equaling to this result, it just sort of resets this variable um, all the way through. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that, let's go ahead and try this out. Of course, I'm inside of day 15. So Python dash I three underscore create underscore gif dot pi hit enter. And notice it's saying it's using image IO. Now this actually takes a good amount of time considering that it's just a gif image. So you can actually do one more thing on this right GIF. You can set a couple options, one of them being frames per second. So I can use it based off of the original clip, which is what its default is, or I can set my own frames per second. You know, if I want it more choppy, I could set it slower. If I want it to be faster also, well, either way, if it's not the same frames per second, it's gonna be choppy feeling. Uh, and then I can also declare the program I want to use. So in my case, I actually want to use FFmpeg. Um, but it used image IO as a default. So we can take a look at sample1.gif and there it is. So it has that width that I set, but this is actually the GIF image and it will loop over and over and over again. That's what GIFs do by, by default. Uh, so this is pretty cool. So this is a nice way if you had a, like a tutorial of some kind for a product, and you just wanted to have GIFs of them, you, this this would be a way to do it. Uh, but let's actually use the program FFmpeg and run this again. So I'll exit out of here. And this time I won't use the interactive shell, I'll just call it and we'll run it again. So now it's using FFmpeg. Um, it's gonna be a little bit faster, but it also might make a much smaller GIF file. FFmpeg seems to be a little bit more efficient at creating GIF files themselves, um, but you get, sometimes you'll get this like weird blurriness to it. So GIFs aren't a perfect, you know, a perfect thing that happen. They don't always work great, um, but you can also, instead of resizing it, you can just leave it as the original size. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Now, if you're getting a lot of very pixelated items, uh, one of the options would be to resize a clip, save it as a video, and then reload it as a new clip from that video and that new size and then run this as well. So that is another option that I've had some pretty good results with too. Okay, so this one crashed, it actually crashed that window, which is pretty funny. Uh, but the reason it crashed it is probably because of the size of the GIF itself. So if I look inside of the directory here, I see the GIF is 175 megabytes at the original size of the video. Um, so, when I run it now, it's not nearly as pixelated as it was, um, but it's still a ginormous file. Uh, so that is something to think about too. Okay, so back in a 30 days, I'll go back to create GIF. And there we go. So I do want to use that resized version and perhaps you'll use it maybe not that quite that small. Uh, you can use 500 as a width, um, but it's really up to you on how you go about doing that. Okay, so the next thing is actually creating a cropped clip. Okay, so I'm gonna be going off of this original clip still. So it's still that same clip. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab the width and the height of this by doing clip.size. And then I already have the frames per second declared, which is this right here. And now I'm gonna go ahead and grab a clip of it, a new clip, or let's call it a subclip two. 
that's clip dot subclip. And again, I'll do the between 10 and 20 seconds. And now I'm actually going to go ahead and crop this clip using that function that I brought in. So to crop this, it's really simple. We'll just call it cropped clip. And that's going to be equal to calling that function itself and then calling subclip to on it. And then the width. So this is going to crop it on how we want. So I'm going to go ahead and say 320 and the height being 320. And then the X center being the width divided by two. And then the Y center being the height divided by two. So this is basically saying, hey, how do we center this image out itself? So this is going to take the exact center of the original clip. It's going to go right in the middle of that, which is what this divided by two is. The Y center is going to take right in the middle of, of that one as well. So even if it's widescreen or it's not already a square, this will actually turn it into a square. So you can think of this as a square clip or square cropped clip. And now we can do square cropped clip right GIF. And this time I'm going to go ahead and give a new output path and we'll give this two sample two, the right GIF and output path frames per second. This time I'm going to go ahead and use the original frames per second. And then the program again being FFmpeg. We save that. The other one, the other GIF that I create, I'm going to go ahead and just comment that one out. Let's open the terminal back up and I probably need to reactivate my virtual environment, the pip -EMV shell, and then I'll go ahead and run Python three underscore create GIF.py. We hit enter and it's just hanging. So control C to cancel it out. Uh, if I scroll down, I actually did a spelling error on FFmpeg. That must have been the issue before as well. So let's go ahead and run this. Now it's actually running. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at our results. So in the finder window, sample2.gif. Um, it is a square image now, and it's off of the time that I designated before, which of course we could compare that to that other sample uh, to, to just see what that is. And that sample is still uh, way too large. So I'm going to go ahead and use the resized version. And I'm also going to use the other frames per second. Okay. Try that again with sample one. And this one, of course, still takes a while because I made it still a fairly large image. Um, so let's see what's going on with this one. And there we go. Um, so it should be 500 pixels wide, which we can verify inside of the finder. It shows me that it's 500 pixels wide. And this is giving me, you know, exactly the same thing that's going on here. It's just, it's cropped in a different way. Okay, so that's how you make GIFs. Now, how useful is this in particular? It's hard to say. I think that if you have a crop size that you're actually looking for, um, it's probably going to be a lot easier of actually cropping a part of a video and then saving that in particular. All right, so I don't know how often you're going to be making GIFs necessarily, but the nice thing to know is that MoviePy has the ability to write GIFs on any clip. So you just have to write underscore GIF just like that on any given video clip and it will create a GIF for you. And I would recommend that you use FFmpeg because the size of the GIF is going to be a lot smaller. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then the other part of this is that if you remember creating a video file is just write underscore video file on any given video clip as well or an image sequence clip. In fact, you can try out write GIF on a whole variety of different places if you need to. Uh, so I'm going to leave these write statements out and I'll let you use it uh, how you see fit. Uh, but that's writing GIFs. So now what we're going to do is add a background soundtrack to our video that just has spoken narration, basically. 
So what we want to do is verify that our inputs have audio and sample. Now, if your video doesn't actually have audio yet, a lot of the methods here will still work. You just skip a step, which I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, but let's go ahead and start off by creating a new file inside of day 15. And this is going to be four and I'll call it mix audio .py. And I'm going to go ahead and go to thumbs .py and just grab some of the defaults there. I'm going to grab the sample related items here. And then I'm also going to grab the output dir, or at least some of the base of it. And this one, I'm going to call this mix audio dir, and I'll call this mixed audio and OS path dot, or rather OS dot make durs and mix audio dir exists. Okay, being true. Okay, cool. So like we've seen before, we're gonna go ahead and grab our original clip. So the clip itself, of course, is video file clip, and it's gonna be the source path. I wanna go ahead and grab the original audio here. So original audio, and that's gonna be clip.audio. And this original audio, I'm gonna go ahead and write an audio file. And this, of course, I need to actually set to a, a path of its own. Uh, and that path is gonna be similar to this mix audio dir, but it's actually gonna use that one. So I'll go ahead and say OG audio path equals to OS path join and this mixed audio directory with OG dot MP3. Uh, and this, I'm going to just go ahead and write that audio file out. I'm going to go ahead and run this now. Let's just make sure that I can actually run it and I can get the correct audio coming out. So mix audio.py and I hit enter. It makes OG.mp3. So in outputs, we got mix audio here. OG MP3. Let's go ahead and reveal this in our finder. Or of course, if you're on Windows, it would be in your file full explorer. And in this case, I actually have it working. I don't know if you could hear it or not, but um, I have that audio working. I definitely just verified that that is the original audio clip. Now, the reason I did it this way has to do with just the finicky nature of MoviePie um, and what we're trying to do here, which is mixing two different audio clips into one and then bringing it right back to that original video clip. Um, so that was that was something that we have to consider with that. Okay, so we have our source video path. Now I'm going to add my source audio path, which I believe I just called. And here we called it audio.mp3. So this is going to be audio.mp3. Okay, and you could open that up and hear what it sounds like, and it's essentially just some free music that we can use. Um, so what I want to do then is grab that as a clip itself. So we're going to go ahead and say background audio clip equals to audio file clip and then our audio source path. So audio file clip is automatically imported with this as well. So I can actually use that one, which is nice. And now what I actually want to have is a subclip of this, right? So I want it to be the same length that this video is. So I'm going to go ahead and just call this BG music equals to this background audio clip and we'll say sub clip. And I'm going to go zero and clip dot duration. See, I've been using clip a lot here. So why don't I call this the actual video clip? So I don't actually get too confused as to what's going on here with the various clips and sub clips and all that. So now I've got my original video clip. It creates an audio path for me. And then I have a new audio file, the sample, and then we just get a clip of that or a sub clip of that. Now it's, I think it's safe to assume that the video file clip, our source video file, its audio clip is gonna be the same length as our original video clip. So I don't actually have to sub clip that one either. But of course you could if you wanted to clip out pieces of it. Um, so now that we've got this, what I want to do is actually change the volume of this background music. 
Now you can inspect it on your own, but the idea is that that actual audio is kind of loud. Now maybe you hear this or not, but it is kind of loud in comparison to the source audio or the original audio uh, that is coming through. So I want to change that volume. Now there's a few different ways on how to go about doing this. One of them is just doing it directly here. So I'll say BG music equals to BG music dot volume X. And then whatever I want to times the original volume or whatever the actual volume of that source is times whatever this value is. So if it's at a hundred, then this would be 10% of that, right? So this is a 10% of that original volume. Uh, and that actually might be still kind of loud. It really just depends on, on the volume itself. So one method to inspect this is you can actually write this as an audio file too. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna verify it here, uh, but you totally could and potentially should to verify that the volume is actually changing. And of course, there's another method we can use to actually change the volume. So the method that we would use is from moviepi.audio.fx.all. I'm gonna import the volume x method and then instead of calling it like this we can use another method which is dot fx and then passing volume in here or volume x rather in here and that will do the exact same thing or at least it should do the same thing so try either one of those methods to see how the volume is now keep in mind if you have both of these going it's going to change the volume here and then it's going to change it again, right there, which, you know, may or may not be what you want. Okay, so now we have two different audio clips and then our original video clip. So what I wanna do is actually combine those two audio clips into being my final audio. And this is called a composite audio clip. Now it's a composite audio clip because it's actually stacking them on top of each other. There's another one called a concatenated audio or concatenated video where it brings them together like from end to end. Composite layers them on top of one another in the order that you specify. So if I list, put a, pass a list through here, I'm gonna pass the original audio and then the BG music, right? So again, that original audio is from this file here. So we may or may not want to reload the original audio in here, or we may or may want to use like the original audio file, actually grab that audio file and reload it in as a clip itself to do this actual final audio clip. That is a method that you might consider trying because again, this movie pie is really good, but there's some little bugs that sometimes just don't work. And, and I found that audio is one of those things that has that potential issue. So with this, I'm gonna go ahead and actually create a final audio output. So the OG audio path, I'm gonna put the final audio path and I'll call this final-audio.mp3. This final audio I will write out. So final audio, write audio file, just like that. And yet another thing that we could verify here that the original audio and the background music are now combined prior to ever even adding it to a video. Um, so now that we've got that, all we need to do is actually set the new audio to our video. Okay, so we can take the original video clip from up here and we can set audio or change the audio based off of this final audio. So it's real simple. We say final clip equals to, and there's gonna be video clip dot set audio. And in this case, I did the final audio itself. And then we're gonna go ahead and say final clip dot write video file. And now we need an output video file. So I'm gonna write next to the final audio path. I'm gonna call this the final video path and final video dot mp4. Going down to final video and there we go. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and leave it like this and we're gonna run it. I think that there might be an error, but let's go ahead and try it out. 
We'll do Python four underscore mix underscore audio dot pi. We hit enter. Okay, so it's going to output a number of files. Oh, and I get a, my first error composite audio clip has no attribute frames per second. So the frames per second in this case is going to be related to the original audio. So this write audio file, um, or, or rather the actual time that we export it, we want to do FPS equals to, well, we want to get the original audio, whatever that speed is, that's what we're going to want to use. So original audio dot FPS, not the same as frame per second for a video, uh, but that's what we need to pass just like that. Let's try that again. Okay, it seems to be out outputting all of my audio. Now let's go into my outputs, mixed audio. So I should see final audio here. And I actually can tell that the background music that I created is now working with that new background music. Uh, so the original files here, just the audio, which is kind of cool to see too. We can parse out the audio from an original file just like that. Uh, and it looks like my video is ready. So let's go ahead and try it. And I don't have any audio. Okay, so this actually didn't write the file correctly. So I could potentially have the correct audio, but I think it's because of my encoding. Actually, I know that. So I'll go ahead and say codec equals to libx264. Now this should be something that FFmpeg has for you. Uh, if it doesn't, you might have to install these additionally. And of course, let me know if that is your case. Because again, using audio and video is not all, does not always play that well together. And then the audio codec is going to be AAC. So this should actually solve the MP4 video file. It might not, but let's go ahead and try it out. Of course, it's going to make all of those files all over again, um, which you didn't necessarily have to do here. But if you run into any errors with these codecs, then Obviously this part would have stopped and stopped you in the tracks. And please let me know in the comments because I definitely wanna help you solve this problem and hopefully other people can chime in as well if you know the answer to that. Uh, because these codec things, it's just, it's just uh, another nightmare to worry about. Okay, so now that I changed the codecs on the output, it's all working. So the audio and video in my case is definitely working. Um, so a couple things to try if you do run into errors. One of them being that we take this final audio and do a new audio set. So I'll say new audio equals to the audio file clip and then actually grabbing in what that final audio path is. And then your final clip, instead of being based off of the instance that we created there, but rather being based off of a newly loaded in audio. That is one thing that you could try for this. Of course, there's different codecs if you need, um, but more than likely if this worked, then this should as well with the correct codec. And it's all gonna be dependent on what video file you end up using. So MP4 needs these two codecs. So we should be good for you, for you to be able to do this on your machine as well, as long as you have FFmpeg installed. So that's mixing audio. Um, I realize that it's, probably just a lot of like writing things and not fully understanding exactly what's going on. But just keep in mind that the composite audio clip, that's the thing that brought it together. Everything else was stuff that we pretty much already covered to some degree, except instead of using video, now we're using audio. Now what we're gonna do is overlay text on our video. We're even gonna make a little text intro with some music and then add it to our original input file and see what the result is. Now, you could use a lot of these methods to also put an image somewhere in there where it's overlaid of an image, but uh, we're just gonna cover the text portion of this. If you need the image part, just check the docs for that because I think once you know how to do the text, it's really easy to do the image. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a new file here and I'm gonna call this five overlay text now pi okay. so in mix audio i'm actually going to copy a lot of these original things all the way down to the background audio clip okay so let's close this down 
So the background audio clip, um, I actually am not going to leave it that duration. Any like the BG music is not actually going to be that duration anymore. I'll change it to something different. And then this final video will be the overlay video and perhaps the overlay audio. Uh, I'm not actually possible sure if we'll have the entire final audio video clip in there if we need. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and actually create a text video. And that's it. Nothing else, just a text video. And I'm going to go ahead and say duration or rather intro duration and we'll say five seconds. So go intro text and this is going to be equal to a text clip. Now the text clip itself is going to be imported from MoviePy editor. Make sure you import that if you need it. So text clip and I'll just go ahead and say hello world exclamation mark. We'll add a font size. That's one word. We'll say go ahead and say 70. We'll add a color of white and then the actual size of it. I'll go ahead and say clip dot size. Now, this is not the size of the text itself, but rather like the box that the text lives in. OK, so just keep that in mind. So what this is going to do is going to make it right in the center. Now, for some reason, if you wanted to change the size of the clip, you totally could. Just remember that the height and width of the original clip is just clip dot size. And I'm using clip. I meant to say video clip dot size. So this is like as if we were drawing a box, the size, the same size of this video clip. And now we're just going to have just a little bit of text in it. And it's only going to show the text. It's not going to show anything else. But by default, the background will be black. So we don't have to really change anything other than the color of the text to make sure that it can be seen. OK, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and set this duration. So we'll do intro underscore text dot set duration. In this case, I can just say the intro duration here. I can set the duration like the number of seconds that I actually want to use. And like any other method in MoviePie, it actually returns back the instance that we need. So we grab that. And then we can also set the frames per second. It's actually a good idea to set the frames per second to the frames per second we want to use on our final video, which in this case is just going to be our video clip. So I'll go ahead and set that right here. Okay. So set frames per second. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and set the position for it. And this is going to be the position not for the text exactly, but rather for the entire frame that's being put on top of the video itself. And we want to say this is in the center. Uh, we'll see what I mean by this when we actually make a little watermark in the right hand corner. Or like a text watermark in the right hand corner a little bit later. OK, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and do intro text. Dot write video file and it's going to go out to our we'll just use it our final video path so we can see what this looks like. OK, so open up the terminal here. And Python five overlay underscore text dot pi. And creating a video or it actually created the original audio, which we probably don't need to outport or output any longer uh, at this point. We could probably use the one that's already outputted, but in case you changed your video or something like that, just, just get in the habit of outport, outputting it when you need to. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at this, this video itself. I'm gonna open up my finder. Here's my overlay video. And if I open it up, there it is. So cool. And uh, it's only five seconds long, like I said, with that duration. It does the frames per second, like I said. Uh, so that's uh, that's nice. We have text now. Um, so what I want to do is actually combine this with my original video file. And there's a method that we imported by default with this call right here called concatenate video clips. So what we want to say is our final clip is equal to concat innate video clips and then the items that I want to concatenate. I first want to start with the intro text and then I want to start with the video clip, the original one. So this is going to add them to each other. 
first the intro text and then the video clip. So the order that you put the list of items in there, it just extends the video that much longer, essentially. So I could put these back and forth, back to each other, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, that is a way to concatenate them versus the actual composite video clip, which we still will do, where it stacks them. This won't stack them. Okay, so now we've got this final video clip. Let's actually go ahead and create it. And we're gonna write it out and we'll just take a look at what the result is. Um, so again, I'll run the Python overlay text and we'll take a look in the finder. I take a moment for that to finish. So I actually anticipate that this is gonna have the same issue that we had with the audio, mixing the audio. So whenever you want to export your video, just make sure you're using the right encoding or codex for both the video and the audio. Uh, so in this case, I, I, I'm gonna reset it. I mean, I might still have that audio, but I'm gonna have to do some stuff to it in a moment. Uh, and so now what we have, I do not have audio. It's not showing up, uh, but I do have a much longer clip. It's longer by five seconds. Uh, and that's because I have that intro. So concatenate video clips works. And so now I'm gonna have that go and I'll run it again. Uh, but what I wanna do is actually add some audio to this intro text, right? And that audio I wanna use is that background music, that sub clip there. So I'm actually gonna come down here and underneath this intro text, I'm gonna call this intro music now. And it's gonna still take that background audio clip. This time it's gonna to go to the duration of the intro duration. So I can make sure I put that there. And so I want to actually set the actual intro as this music, right? So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and say intro text equals to intro text set underscore audio. And now I've got my intro text music. Okay, so let's save it. I'm gonna verify that the audio came through this time. And sure enough, it did. So I'm gonna run it again. Now I'll have audio on my intro. While that's exporting, we wanna think about the next portion of this, which is adding text over my video clip video. Video clip video, yes. Um, okay, so this now is gonna be, let's call it our watermark text. And this is gonna be again a text clip. In this case, I'll just go ahead and write CFE. The font size, I'll go ahead and just say 30, color being white again, just as my overlay. This time I'm gonna say something like align equals to east. And the size, well, now the size is gonna be W, as in the width of the original video, and then the height that I designate. I'm gonna give it the same height as my font size. Okay, so now I have the watermark text that I want. There's still a few more things I need to set. So watermark text dot set frames per second being the original clip, so video clip, or I think I already designated the FPS right here. Okay, and then the duration. So the duration being set duration, and this duration should probably be the same as the video clip dot reader dot duration. You can also use video clip dot duration. Both of those should work just fine. And then now what I wanna do is actually set the position somewhere different. So I'm gonna go ahead and say watermark text equals to watermark text dot set position. And this time I'm gonna pass in a tuple for bottom, okay? So this means that it's gonna to go to the bottom of the page. Top and center are other options. Um, but right now I've got this aligned to the east versus the west. I don't know why it's not left and right, but it's east and west. So we're gonna align it to the east, which should be on the right-hand side. And then we're setting it equal to this size. So it's gonna be the full width of the entire you know, clip, the video clip itself, the original video clip. Uh, but then the height is not going to be nearly as high. And hopefully what this does is bring it right down to the bottom. Okay. So now that we've got this text, let's actually just verify the 
output of our last part, which should give us audio to the beginning. And sure enough, it does. And it's only for five seconds, hopefully. And there it is. Okay, great. So that part's working. So back in here, we're gonna go ahead and now make a composite video clip. So the composite video clip stacks the, the videos in the way that I want them to. Right, so I want the intro text on top of the actual video itself. Right, so I'm gonna make a composite video clip from the original and the watermark text. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this and I'll say CVC as in co composite video clip equals to composite video clip. And we're gonna pass in the watermark text and then our video clip. And I'm gonna set the size on here to our video clip dot size. The original size for this one, the duration is gonna be the same as the video clip as we might expect. Set duration, the video, uh, video clip dot duration, video clip dot reader dot duration, and CVC equals to CVC dot set frames per second being yes. Okay, so now I've got my new clip here. The problem with this clip is it doesn't actually have audio, right? So this is where you also might run into another issue. So what I'm gonna say here is I'll say CVC equals to CVC is a set audio being none. Okay, so now I've got no audio here. But let's go ahead and use this instead of our final video clip, I'll use this composite video clip and let's take a look at what happens here. Back in the terminal, I'll press up and run it. And I used the wrong variable somewhere in here. I used CVS right there, or CSV rather. So used to writing CSV. Okay, so now with it running, I'll just give that a minute to finish. Okay, with that finished, I hear music here, and then I don't hear music, and I actually don't see my composite video. Okay, so obviously I set audio to be none, so that makes sense. But the problem here is that my watermark text didn't actually hold up. So this is one of those challenges that comes up from time to time, so we're gonna go ahead and get rid of my original video clip and create a composite video clip from this text and add another one and we'll call this the overlay clip and we're gonna make another composite video clip and this time I'm gonna take my original video and then I'm gonna add in my composite video clip and again size being equal to my video clip dot size and then my overlay clip I will add in a lot of these same things. So let's go ahead and just copy them. Okay, and change all of the CVCs to overlay clip. And then after that, what I want is to actually change the audio again, and I'll say set audio. This time I'm gonna use the audio file clip and I wanna grab the original music that I had or the original audio that I had, which was the OG source path or the OG audio path. So we bring that down here. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit wider so we can see it. Okay, so I can just OG audio like that. So now we've got our overlay clip here and let's bring that in okay so we save it and let's run it again so it's not quite done yet but one of the things that is important here is actually the ordering of the composite video clip if you put your top level thing first as in my text if i put that before the main video it's actually going to be gone like we're not going to see it so the ordering of this actually matters the watermark text should be last because it's putting the first thing inside of this composite clip at the bottom. Um, 
and then it's stacking each every everything after that, which kind of makes sense. I mean, if you think about concatenate, it starts with the intro and then adds to it after that. So this is the base. This is like the foundation. This is level one, level two, and so on. So our composite video clip in this case is correct, or it should be. So if we check in our overlay video and just click over to where our item is, what I actually see here, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just pause this. I see that there's my text off in the corner there. Um, so of course I can make it bigger and change how that fits and all that. Uh, so I actually don't need those dual composite video clips there. I just needed to change the ordering. Um, so that's a fairly simple thing, but it's important to see that, yeah, you can combine composite video clips for sure. No big deal there. That's one thing. And number two, to see the actual ramifications of not having these in the correct order. Um, so now that we've got that, we actually have completed everything that I wanted to do here, which was adding a watermark to that video. And of course, if you wanted to change the size, let's go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and just say watermark size and we'll use let's try 60 this time and i'll put that instead and then i want to align it on the west side or the other side of the video i'll go ahead and run it again and this time now we only have one composite video clip with our primary video clip at the base and then all of our text so text by default has an opacity to it so it actually you can see through the text to what's underneath it uh, which is really nice because of text um, sometimes you want to overlay text you don't want to have like a black bar around it or something like that so that's where coming in with this is pretty useful so now with it done i have my like little text over here with cfe and it's now on the left hand side um, you can also add something called margin around any one of these clips. So margin just gives it a little bit of extra padding. So we could say this dot margin and you could do left or right or left equals to two, right equals to two, bottom equals to two, top, you know, opacity equals to zero. That's another thing that you can add in there as well. Or you could do even bigger numbers if you'd like. So that's pretty cool that we have that ability now. Um, so as far as the overlays are concerned, um, they are definitely useful, but just remember that the main video that you want to be overlaid on needs to be at the bottom of this composite video clip. Okay, so that actually does it for us with MoviePie and Day 15. Now, I actually think this is a good time for you to go and check out some of their example scripts. They have all sorts of really cool things that they can do that are a lot more advanced than what we've done here. But now that you have a basis of it, you can actually go in and use some of these scripts and have a better understanding of even doing it. Now, personally, I think just creating thumbnails is enough uh, for what the purpose of using MoviePie, just thumbnails itself or even doing machine learning analysis. Um, and, but those things kind of go hand in hand. So the idea here is that we now have a way to generate videos, images, and text all through Python. So it's up to you now to make this as creative as possible, right? So like, how do you actually go one step further and make just some really cool videos automatically without really writing all of this code. Like, can you make that? I think you can. Um, so I'm really interested in seeing what you guys come up with. Please upload them to YouTube and send a link in the comments below. I would definitely love to check out any cool Python program generated videos that you might come up with. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next day.